Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the videotaping of the exercise called the Compass EZ. This is the little tool that we're going to be working with this morning. Um, today, we have um, a number of people who have volunteered to do something which is really cool, which is to go through a little bit of an experience and capture it on videotape so that the folks who deliver services out there across Orange County have an example of how you use the compass in the very best way and um, what you get from using the compass. So we're going to work with teams in sequence and um, capture their real live experience on the videotape and be able to uh, answer some questions that they might have, all for illustration. Um, today we also have a very uh, wonderful live audience who's here to witness what we're going to do and also learn some things so that they can go back and translate what they learned to their particular service settings and other folks that they might relate to. So our focus this morning is on working with the Compass EZ. And um, before we get started with the tool itself, though, I wanted to introduce this lovely team of people. And could I get someone to um, uh, tell the folks out there in the viewing land who you guys are and what organization you're from and a little bit about what you do. Okay, good morning. Uh, the Orange County Department of Mental Health oversees the operation of three clinics. Two are licensed in the community, one's in the Orange County Jail. The group here today is a represent, representative group of the Poor Jervis Clinic. It's located in the western part of Orange County near the borders of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. The Child and Family Clinic serves adults, children, um, and has a current capacity of in excess of 700 uh, consumers. We have an addiction component where Suboxone is treated, uh, provided as a treatment option. There are six licensed social workers, nurse practitioners, and psychiatry. Great, thank you. So uh, let's go around the table and introduce, if you would say your name and uh, what function you have in the organization. Um, and remember to project so everybody can hear your lovely voices. Okay, why don't we start here? I'm Sandra Atkin. I'm the administrative officer. I do, um, I'm in charge of the billing for the clinics and multiple other things. Tom Balzan, deputy commissioner. I also serve as the director of clinical services and oversee the operation of both of our licensed outpatient clinics. Lacey Trimble, I'm the director of the Port Jervis Outpatient Clinic. Um, I do the day-to-day -day supervision operation. Carol Braun, I'm the senior secretary. I do intake, I do medical, medical records, and I welcome people into the clinic. Good morning, my name is Fran Hafkin. I'm front desk secretary. I welcome our clients into the clinic, check out their insurance, and do various um, secretarial chores throughout the office. Fabulous. So this is Port Jervis. Wonderful. Thank you guys very much again for doing this. It's a kind of a step up thing to do. All right. So let me um, take a moment and go over the instructions for Compass. Tom, if you would pass everybody out one of these tools, that would be great. Now, I'm going to walk through the instructions just so that folks out there who would be viewing the tape understand a little bit about how to go about using the tool. And for you guys, because I'm going to walk you through some questions, okay? So just sit back and listen. Um, I'm going to say the obvious thing, and, and I'm, I'm always kind of tickled by this, but um, <clears throat> it's really good when you start this process to actually read the directions. Because it's kind of like, you know, when you, when you were uh, buying your kids a, uh, a bicycle for Christmas and you had to put it together and you didn't read the instructions and somehow or another you had some screws and nuts left over and it made you a little bit nervous. Okay, so reading the instructions is really good. We, we went to uh, a level of detail on these instructions to describe how to use the tool but also to do some teaching within the instructions. So there are things about defining terms, um, there are things that are little teaching points about how to uh, organize a group and uh, walk through a process which is uh, intended to do a self-assessment. So it's really good first order of business is to think about um, getting everybody to actually read those directions. So anything that I might say is probably captured in, in the set that's written for you, okay? 
So here's the deal. The Compass is a tool that we use to help organizations um, really take a serious look at the build-out of the program. Okay, so the object of attention is the program itself. It's not the individual service provider. It's not the system as a whole. It's that specific program. So we always like to say, if in the beginning of time you knew then what you know now about who you were really going to be serving, which is a whole bunch of people and families who have lots of complex issues, how would you have built everything out for yourselves to make the job of caring for those folks as easy as possible for yourselves and for them? And in doing that, we challenge things in this tool that have um, everything to do with program, uh, maybe starting with program philosophy, uh, moving through things like uh, the actual clinical charting uh, activities, like doing assessments and charting those assessments, doing integrated treatment plans. We look at things like uh, our ability to collect data that fairly represents what it is we're doing. Uh, and capture the needs of the people that we're serving. And we look at things like our relationships with our external partners. So how good are we at um, being in partnership with those who might do things that we don't do so that we can get some help from those partners to always kind of raise our capacity, our abilities within our own services. So it's a pretty robust set of questions. Um, it is not the intention of this tool to, um, to cover everything but it's enough to get everybody seriously thinking about the architecture of, of the program, okay? Now, <clears throat> the main point of using the tool is to establish a baseline for where the program is at this moment. So doing this tool lets you see, it's a snapshot of the, uh, the build out and the performance, so to speak, in the softest sense of the word, the performance of the program around its complete, what we call complexity capability. Um, it is not intended to generate that tense feeling of, oh my gosh, there's so many things we could do, we have to do them all. The, the purpose of the tool is to, to get people talking, get teams of people talking together so that you can identify the most important things to you um, that you might want to work on to take your organization forward, um, all with the intent of improving things so that we better meet the needs of our customers. It's a customer service orientation. The, um, the end product of doing this tool is a conversation. It is a scored tool, but the scoring on this tool is just intended to bring uh, teams conversations together so that we don't leave big items dangling out there in the ether unattended to. So the scoring process is not to set an absolute marker of one to five in terms of performance. It's literally we go around and consensus score so that we can bring our conversation kind of to a head so we know where we are with it. So don't be nervous about whether we rank high or low on a question. The, the most wonderful answer is the one that you honestly feel is correct. Okay, so if you score on the low end of the spectrum, <clears throat> a one, that's a round of applause. Okay, if you score on the upper end of the spectrum, it's an equal round of applause. If you score in the middle, it's yet again another equal round of applause. Okay, so your, your honest, accurate interpretation is the best answer, okay? Now, when we go through this, uh, what you'll find uh, as, we, as different organizations do this, you have liberty, and it explains a little bit about this in the written instructions, you have liberty to define complexity, okay? So some organizations will do very different things than other organizations. So for example, if you um, deliver domestic violence services, and that's your orientation, then domestic violence and trauma are gonna be very high on your radar screen. That's gonna be something that is uh, right in front of you day to day. Your customers with, with domestic violence issues also will be dealing with things that have to do with correctional issues, with substance abuse issues, with mental health issues, with child welfare issues. So bringing the robustness of the considerations that your customers have into your conversation is important in this tool. 
Um, the starting place, since this particular tool, the Compass EZ, is designed for programs who specifically offer mental health and or substance use services, um, the directions are written to say, expand your thinking when you're doing this to incorporate the issues that you know are commonly prevalent in your populations. And if you can push even beyond your own envelope, that's a really good thing because what we're talking about is complexity. The average ordinary person who comes for service and the family that they come with is routinely dealing with complex issues. It is the work that we do. And it is the expectation, not the exception, that that complexity is present day in and day out within the individuals and families that we work with. So push your thinking, push your thinking forward when you do this, and fairly represent yourselves in this tool, okay, by virtue of what you do for a living and by virtue of what you understand that you might need to do to, to appropriately kind of meet the needs of the people that you have. So uh, being expansive is good. Um, do not worry, do not worry at all that you have to have the perfect explanation or the perfect description or you have to already know everything that there is to be known in order to do well on this, on this process. Um, oftentimes what we find is that when teams repeat this process, maybe six months or a year uh, going forward, uh, their, their, um, their whole interpretation of the issues shifts because they've been working on improving things and you understand so much more by doing. So you learn and you grow as you go and then when you get to that next place where you sit and you say let's, let's reset our baseline because we've improved, you may read a question and, and have that, I call it the V8 moment, oh my gosh. You know, we didn't really even understand what we were answering the first time we did that. Look at us, we scored ourselves so high. How do we rationalize this now? Because when we really think about it, we would put ourselves at a much lower score now, even though we've done so much work. And there's actually a term for that. It's called, um, it's a sigma shift in uh, statistics where the numbers actually drop because you've become more educated about what the topic is. Don't worry if that happens. It's what you learn that's important. It's not what you score. The learning out of your conversation is important and you anticipate that you'll be smarter as you go down the road doing things. So whatever you do in this conversation is exactly what was intended to be done and that's good enough, okay? Let me to the scoring and let me, let me just um, talk about the scaling of this for a minute. It's one to five, not at all to um, doing things in, um, not perfection, but uh, completely is how we, we rank it on the score. Um, the, the scores are in whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five. If you find yourself locked up in a conversation where you really just can't agree on something, it's okay to be obsessive and pick a 3.5 if you have to, but if you go to 7, 3.75, I am a psychiatrist, I can prescribe medications for that, right? <laughs> So we don't need to be that accurate, it's not that accurate to start with, don't worry. If one of you really has a very, one or a couple of you really has a strong differing opinion and you just want to fall on your sword for that differing opinion, it's all right to say for that question, most of us felt this way and one of us, bless our heart, has such a different experience with this that their true interpretation is just vastly different from the rest of us. And you just kind of write that down and you move on. Now that's a good thing though to think about because if you have that big of a difference of opinion amongst the things that, that you all bring to the table, there's probably something that you need to talk about as a team and resolve. So that's an important marker for something that might be important to take back and really consider when you, when you accomplish this task uh, for real, so to speak, back, back home. Um, the consensus scoring, and consensus we just mean, let's kind of figure it out together. Where do we think? Pick a number. Where are we? Um, the consensus scoring is really just like I said, to bring the conversation to a head. That's all it is. Okay. Now, as you go through your conversation, the most important thing to pay attention to is where did you have your natural energy? Where did you hang out in your conversation? Because it was important to you. Because where you hang out is most likely where you're going to find the things that you most innately want to improve. OK? 
everything. And there's a section at, uh, at the end of each section, there's a place that says action plan notes. That's where you want to write down, I call them like sparks of light. Write down what you thought you got to in your conversation that was important to you so that you don't have to go back and repeat the conversation because you will take those things that you thought were important out of your conversation and translate them into an improvement plan or what we call an action plan. It's kind of like superhero action plan for your organization so that you can get organized to do continuous quality improvement exercises or process improvement to improve those things. So you don't want to have to go through this lovely conversation and then repeat it again to figure out what you're going to do. So it's really good to take quick notes in that section so that you capture it. Okay? And you can do that individually and then come back together as a team and make sure you're on point with each other before you create your action plan. And just review your notes. Okay? You will have one set of scores for your program. Okay, there'll be one Compass tool where you write your consensus scores. And at the back of the, uh, at the, back of the tool is this little orange and blue recording sheet where you write those numbers down. You have one for the program. You don't go back to your office and all score this individually and then have uh, you know, a multitude of compasses for the program. It's just one set of scores, okay? Um, because that's, the, that's indicative of you guys having had a team conversation. Okay? Um, you can pass this out if you want to folks who might be coming to the table to do this so that people can be familiar with it, but you actually don't have to. Um, and you certainly don't want people feeling compelled to score it on their own. Because you want to save that lovely conversation for when you're together because it's really you guys talking that's important. Um, now, let's talk just for a couple of seconds about who would be doing this. Okay? You guys are representative of a mix of people who have different functions. So you have administrative, you have people who are on the front, front, front lines at the front desk, you have people who are responsible for clinical operations and day-to-day -day operations, oversight and, and delivery. And that's very good because you represent different aspects of the whole elephant of the program. When you do this for real, you want to think about, and all the organizations out there that might be listening to this, what you want sitting around the table is you want a snapshot of your organization. Who are we? What do we do? The total robustness of it. Um, and do we have fair representation of all of those perspectives at the table? And this is important for a continuous quality improvement reason. Um, what we find is that if you're in the problem solving business, for a complex organization. The more perspective you have, the better your solutions uh, are implemented in that program. So if you decide things horizontally, and what I mean by that, like if you bring uh, a room full of supervisors together to do problem solving, the, the, the solutions are not as robust as if you did things vertically where you went through levels of responsibility. So you want to be both horizontal in terms of responsibility and you want to be vertical. And you want to capture all the dimensions and domains of things that you do because you want that solution to the problem, whether we're talking about an MIS problem or a, a practice delivery problem or a billing uh, problem that we have. You want the solution to that to be resolved by your total team because it's your total team that's going to be impacted by it. Okay? So if we get used to, to working in really robust teams as teammates in problem solving, we're going to come up with a system that has much richer capacity to actually come up with solutions you can use and, and sort of, you know, cull out all that time that's wasted by having, you know, top-down things that really don't result in saving time or pro providing better care. Or bottom-up things that just get frustrated because you bump your head on the ceiling of being able to implement things. So we've got to meet in the middle and be good round teams, so both horizontal and vertical, okay? So um, that is the general set of instructions. I am going to walk you through, don't worry about a thing, I'm going to walk you through a choice set of questions. We're just going to do a few questions, and I'm going to take you through by the hand uh, on the first and a little bit on the second, set, second question, kind of like training wheels. 
and then I'm going to yield it over to you guys, and you'll pretend like I'm not here, and you'll put yourselves in the in the 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 role of doing this for real back home, and I'll I'll watch you do probably a third question, and um, then we'll pause and we'll process a little bit, and we can maybe entertain some questions or something like that if something is still unclear. Okay, so you guys ready? All right, so I'm going to start you guys. It's always good to like start kind of at the beginning. Um, so if you you all wouldn't mind uh, flipping to page one, section one, program philosophy. Now what you want to do with these questions is you want to take turns reading them aloud. And the reason you take turns is because it gives everybody an opportunity to start getting their voice to the table. This is, a, this is a democracy, so if you work in an autocracy <laughs> uh, or a monarchy, um, you, you want to do a little bit of a conversation with yourselves about how to have everybody be able to voice their opinion without feeling like they're uh, overly, um, they're overwhelmed by a predominant voice or uh, a little bit nervous about expressing themselves. So if you're in a position in a program where you haven't really captured that kind of a culture yet, um, you could use this exercise to promote that culture, um, but you may actually want to do a little bit of team building before you go into this exercise so that you move through some of that um, tenseness. So some organizations um, are ready to go. Other organizations may do a little bit of team building first. Okay, so I'm going to assume you guys are ready to go because you're here. You wouldn't volunteer to be on this videotape if you weren't already a cool culture. Okay, <laughs> so um, I will ask, and why don't we start here? I will ask you all to read the question, and then I'm going to walk you in a circle so that you guys can get your voices to the table and then help you have a little conversation. So I'm actually going to start with question number two. So, take it away. Written program descriptions specifically say that individuals and family with co-occurring issues are welcomed for care. Okay, so for you guys operating a robust service, just convert co-occurring to complexity because you already know you're in the complexity business, okay? So, since you got the, the honor of reading the first question, you can start by getting a little bit of your thinking out, out into the ether here. I think um, exactly that, that you want to welcome the client. I think the clients that come into our facility um, need caring, need uh, to know that we're there to help them. And I think the people that come to our clinic are uh, brave because they are now at a point where they're looking for help. And so as um, the first person they see when they walk in the door, that's, my, that's my, um, my priority, to make them feel welcome and to let them know that we can help them. And then to pass them on down to the senior secretaries who will uh, learn more about their issues and see where it is we can place them for the, for the best care that we can offer. That's a great way to get us started. How wonderful. Wow, well, I'm lucky to have you in the program. Thank Yay. you. <laughs> Yay. So why don't, we, why don't we just make the circle and everybody put their thoughts out? Okay. Um, I actually read it as like a written program description, so I was thinking about our brochure, and, and it, it does say everything that we are about and the different um, issues that we deal with. So that's how I kind of interpreted that. So I think it's appropriate, our, our written material is appropriate for the program. Very cool, very cool. I like how you brought it to the question uh, that's there because it is it is um, it does say program, written program descriptions so this is a good thing because you know you can start by saying hey you know look how cool we are <laughs> you know we are really invested in making sure that these folks who are so uh, uh, in need of our heart um, get a great experience the moment that they come in and it brings us you know, increasingly to focus around the questions that's here, and you say, okay, well, it says written program description, so let's think about concretely, do we have them? Where, you know, what are they? And or do we feel like they're adequate to represent what we really do? Very cool. I think a few years ago, we updated the brochure to include that we are more co-occurring capable and 
not just focusing on the mental health needs, but the whole person. Um, I do think it needs improvement still. I think for some of our, our feedback we've gotten, it's a little hard to read for some people, so we need to, to adjust it still, but I think we've come a long way from where we started. Very good, very good. Tom? I'm always struck by the level of complexity for the people that we serve in the Port Jervis Clinic that um, we know the names of the families and the individuals and um, the front desk staff and the clinic staff um, are very aware of uh, the nuances associated with where they sit or how they interact or um, are understanding if they don't have their co-payment. And it just really um, goes to, I think, support the nature of the work that uh, many of the individuals have uh, complex issues that uh, start from the moment they walk through the door as opposed to only when they get into the therapist's office. Very good, very good. Um, I probably have less to say about this one because I'm really not at the front door and I really have not seen the brochure completely, but um, I would like to think that we're all welcome in. Um, being on the bill inside, my concern is always payment to go along with that welcome in, so mm -hmm. it can be complicated, but yet still try to help everybody. Okay. So, hey, we made it around the table. Fabulous. Okay, so the next task is to think about how you would group rate where you think your program is with regard to that question. So you guys have to kind of talk to each other a little bit about how you would individually score and then collectively come up with your number. Not at all, slightly, somewhat, mostly, completely. I was thinking because Lacey said that, you know, the um, brochure needs to be, you know, written possibly differently for our clients to understand it. So I don't think we should go completely. So. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think uh, we're really good at it, but from a written standpoint, we probably could be better. And I think there's always room for improvement no matter where we're at. So. Some of our clients, um, many of our clients have different capabilities. So some might not have the ability to read and understand. So again, there's, um, I would say, somewhat. Okay. So what number do you think you guys would collectively choose? It's good to, to, to actually go around and state your number individually mm -hmm. and see if maybe by chance you all landed on the mm -hmm. same one. So we had a three here. I would do a three. I'd say probably, for me, I'd say mostly. I think we're close, but not quite where we need to be. I would agree. I would go four. I was going to go four also. Okay. Now so. comes the tricky work of saying, are we going to pick a three or a four? Well, since they're in the business of writing the, um, <laughs> the description, <laughs> I think I would lean towards their right. four. <laughs> I would okay. go but, but, but then in that respect, I would probably, since you both think it's somewhat, maybe defer more to you because then maybe you could help to improve it. Well, I guess somewhat seems a little harsh. As, yeah, yeah, it does. If you think about it, I guess thinking about it now, it does seem a little harsh. And again, Lacey said, you know, we're th almost there, not quite. So I would guess mostly would best describe it, I think. Okay. okay. So what are we going to pick? Four. Four. Yay. Okay. You know what you get for a four? <coughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. If you'd have picked a three, guess what you would have gotten? <laughs> Yay. Okay. All right. So let me do a little bit of work with this question because you, you, you guys offered up some great teaching moments. So um, the thing that, that uh, I particularly uh, picked up was the thing that you said is, well, maybe if... Uh, some of us think we have more work to do than others of us. Maybe those folks would be great to offer some hopefulness to designing the next round of things. And I really like that because when you were describing um, your relationship to the program descriptions, you said, well, I'm in billing and I know, you know, I'm intimately connected with what the billing issues are, but I've not really seen the program descriptions. So I'm not really sure, I can't, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I'm kind of familiar with everything, but I'm not particularly sure about that. Um, the thing that I think of is that when you think about um, your capacity as a total team, what you guys are bringing to the table is you're saying, hey, there's probably more of us that would have really interesting contribution if we were sitting a little bit closer together. 
and there's probably some of us that would um, would probably maybe even think it was uh, a cool thing to have more access to the materials and the processes of the organization so that it just feels like you're sitting more connected to what's going on. Okay? So when you, when you talk about things, um, the way this tool is designed is there's the explicit question and then there are the things that come out of what you talk about. Okay? And it's okay if you get to something that you talk about that you think is important to you, even if that question is not asked. It's okay to say, hey, that's something we could really do that would help us maybe be a stronger team or it would help us you know, identify something that um, we really need to do or it's connected to something else we're trying to do. So don't feel constricted. Okay, if, you t if you really talk and you get in your conversation to a cool idea and you really resonate with it, that's a great thing to say, let's put that on our action plan. Okay? So with this question, what you would ask yourself is, at this point in time, for this organization, for Port Jervis, is it something that we want to pick up and take on uh, to improve our written program descriptions? Okay? And you may very well say, not so much, because we just wrote them. And if we went through that process again, we would pull our hair out, okay? Or you might say, oh my goodness, CARF is coming, and we're going for accreditation, and we're gonna have to rewrite all of our materials anyway, and so this is a choice opportunity for us to upgrade them. That's what we were gonna do on Tuesday, right? So yay, we could put that on our action plan and actually get credit for the work that we're doing anyway, okay? Or you might have something in between. So you don't have to have a step for every question, you can say, not so much today, let's, let's put that in the parking lot and maybe, maybe next year we'll do that, or maybe three months from now, or maybe at our next staff meeting we'll pick that question up again and talk about it, okay? So you got liberty to do that. Okay, so you guys did a very fabulous job. Okay, now I'm gonna take you forward, and I'm actually gonna flip you to, um, I'm gonna flip you to page four. <clears throat> okay, and I am going to, let's just go around the circle, and I'm going to do any, mini, miny, mo. I'm going to pick, uh, let's do question number two again. Okay. Individuals and families receive welcoming access to appropriate service regardless of active substance use issues. Example, blood alcohol level, urine toxicology, screen, length of sobriety, or commitment to maintain sobriety. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I was reading yeah, again yeah, and trying to... Uh, <laughs> no, it's all right. Take your um, time. Take it in. <clears throat> I, you know, because we are mental health, when people call and they're looking for services, and um, as Tom had mentioned before, we do have a doctor that prescribes Suboxone. Well, we try to get them to focus on what their mental health issues, because that needs to be the primary, even though they have a substance abuse issue also. So um, I think we leave the door open for them to come to us to, you know, make it a, pr um, to give us something that says they do have a mental health issue and that yes, we'll work on it. And then once we bring them in and they speak with the therapist, then they go further um, dealing with their substance abuse issues. And then the therapist would then refer them to the, that specific doctor if it needs be. Mm -hmm. So, okay, cool. I think that the senior secretaries do a really good job of screening people to the point of saying, you know, we have to find something to justify bringing them in because that's you know, regulated by OMH, but also if we can't meet that, they're very good at referring people to places that can, giving them all of the phone numbers. So we very rarely have somebody that we can't bring into the clinic, but if for some reason we can't or they need access to services more quickly or more intensely, um, they do connect them to those other places so that they're not left without services. I would agree. A few years ago we changed the access model to our clinic, the front door to our clinic, to really reflect 
when a call comes in to get them in the chair as quickly as possible of where they can get help. So when that call comes to the senior secretary team, they take down basic insurance information, just a triage statement of the problem. But the person who's making the determination of how we can help um, based on their complexity is the therapist doing the intake. So our focus is really getting them through the front door quickly and then um, seeing how we can help them. Um, I, I'm going to wear another hat for this one, and as part of the LGU or the local governmental unit, which we're all part of also being the county, not necessarily the clinics because they're more specific to clinics, um, we would we we are, try to be welcoming to everybody because we deal with all three disabilities in one way or another. But then going back to the clinic end, it's a, on the billing side, it's always a concern if you don't have the diagnosis, you can't bill for these people, and as much as we try to help people, you can't always. But if you can at least send them to the correct door, I think that's very important. Yeah. Um, as a front desk individual, it's not our job to um, delve any further than to show compassion to someone who comes into the clinic. Um, I have learned over my time in the clinic through the professionals that the, when there is an addiction issue, there is usually a mental health issue somewhere along the line. So it's not for us to judge or even know, actually, what their situation is, only to, again, welcome and let them know that we're here to do the best we can for them. Okay, so I'm gonna get you to read the question again. So everybody just, Listen to the question. This is a good technique. So, um, just when you're when you kind of get your first round of things out there, just read your question over again. Oh, I just don't have a. Individuals and families receive welcoming access to appropriate service, regardless of active substance abuse issues. Examples: blood alcohol level, urine toxicology screen, length of sobriety, or commitment to maintain sobriety. Okay, now your job is to pretend like I'm not here and come to resolution on this question. Any thoughts? I think um, we do a really good job of, you know, getting people in and, you know, this kind of information, you know, when the call comes in is something that we don't really get to know about, I think, right? It's not until the intake takes place and we gather more information that we know that, you know, there's a sobriety issue or um, an addiction issue or what the term of sobriety is. Well, I think if when they, call, if they came in or called or they were, you know, um, in some kind of condition of, you know, um, a substance, you know, you could, not that I'm, if you kind of knew that they were actively using and in some kind of condition that we couldn't handle, of course we would go to Lacey or the doctor and then I guess we would also see, you know, if they needed to be, you know, sent somewhere to get treatment right away, if that's the way we're looking at this one. I, I think we do a good job of that, yes, definitely. So if we got a referral call from like New Directions and somebody that was just getting released from the rehab and it was apparent that they had addiction, active addiction issues, that would be kind of a um, turn it over to Lacey to make a special call on, or? Not necessarily, it would depend. Um, you know, again, they need to have, some of them, New Directions doesn't come up with any kind of diagnose, a mental health diagnosis, it's strictly alcohol that they treat them for, and then, you know, then they'll, you know, I guess then we would try to refer them to Catholic Charities or um, restorative management, something like that. So not necessarily, it depends, mm -hmm. it depends. On. See, now I'm gonna look at it a little bit differently. It's like what happens when somebody comes into the door for their regular appointment and for their mental health appointment and they're drunk, they're noticeably drunk, right. obnoxious. I mean, we've all seen that in, their, in our own lives or in clinics or in any kind of a set and most everybody's seen that. I guess that would be how welcoming are we when that happens. 
I think that when someone comes into the clinic and they're obviously inebriated or um, they've taken drugs, um, I would, as a front desk person, call Lacey and let her know we have an, an issue up front. And um, in all the years that I've been there, the clinicians or Lacey or whoever the director was would come right up front. And if necessary, um, they would be transported. We call the police. I mean, if we had someone who was dangerous to either other clinics and the other clients in the clinic. Because that's the other piece of it. There are always a lot of people sitting out in the waiting room and you have to take everyone into consideration. I mean, we even have that in our building, even in, as far as administration. You know, it's like people come in and they're, you, they're having a bad day. And um, we've had to either get a clinician or somebody. We have, like, code words in our building to help out with that sometimes. But to get somebody else that can understand the person to actually deal with the person. I, I think for the part. most part, the way we've handled most situations is somebody who's clinical comes up and meets with the person tries to determine if they're safe or not, brings them back to the office if necessary. I mean, we've done even people who aren't clients yet, they needed help. But we have had a few who, who passed out in the clinic that we had to have transported, those kind of things, but to get them into mm -hmm. the place that was safest for them. And some people that come in and use the phone periodically and mm -hmm. aren't open with the clinic, right? So how would you guys score? I'd say mostly. I'll go four. I, I think we do a good job with it. I would say mostly also. I would go to mostly or completely. Really would. I'd say mostly. I think most people in the clinic do a very good job of being welcoming, regardless of the condition somebody comes in in. I would agree mostly. Access is something that we um, really look at as being one of the most important aspects of the care we provide. So um, I think we do a good job getting people in and determining problems and getting to work on those. Okay. So what do you get? Four. Four? 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 All around four? Okay. So here's what you get from me. Yay. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to um, bring you, you guys to a close here and just uh, give you a little bit of a, a process comment. So. I, I really like the way that when you went back and read the question, it sort of reset your thinking. So when you said, well, I'm going to read it a little bit differently now, okay, and you said, well, I'm going to look, you know, what if we're in an ongoing relationship with somebody? And then we started talking about, well, are we talking, you know, a, an extreme situation where somebody is, is a risk to themselves or others? Are we talking about somebody just using substances because they use and they're not particularly risk, but they're showing up for their appointment? Um, it, it got you to another place. There was a little bit more dimension to what you were talking about. Now, I'm going to um, posit something for you guys, okay? So when you go off on these adventures that we're about ready to go off uh, to in this system, and you uh, do your work, and you grow and you learn, and you come back to this question in, say, six months or a year, um, you will have, I think, a much deeper conversation, okay? So this is a question that gets right at the heart of things. So it's all right to start with the conversation that you had, and it's okay to wind up six months from now in a different place where you're standing there saying, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, look at what we have developed ourselves into now. Because what you've landed on is something that is a strength that you can further build on. Okay? So this question for you guys is an illustration of a strength-based question. So even though you might think we're kind of mostly there, would we pick that up because we're on the mostly spectrum? What I would say to you guys is build off your strengths. Pick some questions where you feel like you've done a great job, but go to the next level with them because, oh, the adventures we're about to have. So you guys did a fabulous job. We're going to transition to the next team now. Thank you so much. What do we give them, guys? Yay!
Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for Thank your you. service.